Uh, my name is Ken Caruso. I'm a co-founder. Hello? Okay. Uh, my name is Ken Caruso. I'm a co-founder of the Seattle Wireless Project and uh, freenetworks.org. And I'm going to do a talk about community wireless networks. And uh, basically, I just want to talk a lot about the, uh, the, impl the political, social implications, uh, how the telephone companies feel about it, and all uh, that type of stuff. Uh, I'm going to use the term free networks. Uh, it's kind of the same thing as a community wireless network. It's a, a term that we coined basically to represent the philosophical ideas and uh, not be tied to any one particular technology because uh, the, the things that really fuel this movement are not are not specific to wireless. Uh, so you know, if we were able to do this with other types of technology, if we were able to you know lay fiber throughout our cities on our own, we we do the same thing that we're doing with wireless. Uh, but basically, right now at a free network is, is uh, there's a couple of different types of free networks, but uh, for the most part, it's a uh, it's a scenario where anyone can join the network, anyone can put up a note on the network. Uh, there's no barrier to entry. All that's required is that you provide the gear and the know-how to run your devices. And uh, the free the free is kind of confusing. Some people think that it's free internet, and uh, it's actually not. We're not necessarily focused on free internet. It's mostly uh, free as in freedom. And uh, as far as the people involved in the project, it's anything but free because we spend a lot of time, a lot of money trying to figure out how to make this stuff work. So uh, I kind of briefly talked about the different approaches. Um, for a couple of the community wireless groups, their mission is free internet access. And as Adam had mentioned earlier, it's kind of like the, the philanthropy aspect of it. Um, uh, and then there's what people uh, consider the isolationist, which is kind of like what Seattle Wireless falls into, where we don't even really care about the internet. We want to build a metropolitan area network that's self-sufficient, that doesn't rely on telco, telco infrastructure at all. And uh, so that means that we're like providing our own core services, DNS, and all that stuff. And uh, we basically want to be able to exist without the internet. Uh, we don't have a problem with the internet, and we don't you know, want the internet to go away, but we want to have a network that's sustainable and uh, that doesn't have to go over telephone company lines. Um, basically, a lot of people want to know kind of why this is happening, and uh, you know what are the reasons why this is starting to why this has started to crop up in the past two years. And uh, there's a couple of things that I've identified. Uh, one of them is that standards-based tech. standards-based technology is available. If you wanted to uh, build a community wireless network, say, three years ago, um, you would have to choose from a technology that, it, that would lock you into one vendor. There were really no established standards, and so you know, you'd have to go to one company, buy all the gear from them, and it was really expensive. Now cards are really cheap. Uh, you can buy a wireless network card. They're selling them in the vendor area for about $50. Uh, and there's a growing desire for connectivity everywhere. Everyone wants to be online all the time. And uh, the hacker community and the techies that are involved with this kind of feel screwed over by ISPs. I mean, we all, you know, when I first got my first home high bandwidth connection, I was really excited. And then I found out, well, you know, I can't run any servers, or they're going to filter certain ports, and there's a lot of things I can't do. So I think a lot of people are kind of feeling screwed over by that. And so they kind of want a, uh, some sort of relief from that technical oppression, if you want. And by building self-sufficient networks where the community is in control, you can do you can do all that stuff. And uh, it's actually it's existed for a long time. Uh, the BBS community, FidoNet, are all good examples of a very, very similar um, movement, you know, very similar motivations. Uh, so basically, there are, uh, there are a lot of people that are not really very fond of the free network free networking movement, and uh, the ISPs in general, like big ISPs like AT&T, you know, and those guys, they don't, they don't like us or they claim they don't like us because they think that we're a threat to their business model and that we're going to give away their bandwidth, which uh, is actually not entirely the case. I mean, a lot of, you know, we understand that bandwidth costs money, and what we do in a lot of cases, and what uh, they're actually doing in Portland, Oregon, is they're working with local ISPs, mom and pop ISPs that are willing to give them uh, connections where they can share internet bandwidth, and in, in turn, they actually get some useful information out of that because now these ISPs can look at a community wireless nodes and they can see how much uh, traffic's going through their nodes and it gives them data and they know whether or not this is actually a threat to their business model. Whereas uh, companies like AT&T, they're not even they don't even want that data, which is kind of a shame because I think if they actually saw the data and what was going on, they might actually change how they feel about it. Um, another 
other reason why the telcos, I think, are kind of upset is because uh, 3G has not taken off. You know, from you, all the people in this room probably understand the difference between the 3G network and the uh, 802.11b network. Completely different things. But to the corporate user or to typical end users, they don't know the difference. All they know is that now they can walk around with their laptop, they can go to the airport, they can go wherever they want, and they can get on a network. Um, wireless ISPs are kind of concerned about it because this is a public band. Uh, it, it, the current technology that we're using operates in 2.4 gigahertz, which is completely unlicensed, which means that anyone can use it. We're in the same band as uh, 2.4 gigahertz cordless phones, uh, the X10 video cameras, and so we're still really concerned because their business model relies on this unlicensed band, you know, which, I don't know, if you ask me, that's kind of a risky business model to have, but uh, it's, it's something that, you know, that has to be considered, and they have no more right to the band than we do. And uh, also the FCC. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing because like Pringles can antennas are really popular. All these parabolic dishes are really popular. But uh, when it comes down to it, there's a lot of regulations about using antennas with 802, with 802.11b uh, cards. And uh, it is technically against FCC regulations to use a Pringles can antenna because the antennas do have to be certified with a specific card that you're using. Uh, so who likes us? Well, actually, and this is kind of a, on, on the other side of it, uh, I think a lot of the bigger ISPs that have been offering uh, all you can eat internet access for a long time, or for, I'm sorry, for the past couple of years, actually do kind of like the fact that this movement is coming about because it gives a little bit, it takes away a little bit of the burn because, you know, they've been giving, they've been doing this all you can eat internet access. They're starting to find out that, you know, they're not making money on it. And now this is kind of something that they can focus, uh, not necessarily their attention to, but they can say, look, you know, there are these people doing this. This is the reason why we're not making money, and it's kind of another excuse for them to go from this all-you-can-eat internet access uh, model to value-added services, you know, where you have to pay if you want to use a VPN or you want to, you know, you have to pay extra for all this, all these additional things. And uh, the media, of course, loves us because it's kind, you know, the, because of the controversy. Every single media person you talk to, that I talk to, they want to know, you know, well, how, you know, does AT&T hate you? Do you guys get into fights on the phone? You know, all, all this crazy stuff. So, uh, and there's a lot of confusion too. Uh, one of the one of the most common questions that people want to ask is, you know, why would you do this for free? What, you know, why in the world would you want to do something like that? Uh, venture capitalists, you know, I get calls from VCs probably about once a month wanting to know like what my secret plan is to make money. They think that you know somewhere stashed away after about two years I'm going to come up with some brilliant idea and I'm going to turn this thing into like you know a multi-million dollar business, but which is totally not the case. And uh, they want to know who pays for it. They don't understand that you know people will do stuff on a volunteer basis. I mean, with Seattle Wireless, uh, all of our nodes are owned by individual people. They pay for the equipment. They pay for, you know, they, they spend their own time. Uh, there's no real, like, centralized, you know, repository for funds or anything like that. So uh, they don't understand why someone would go out and buy equipment, spend time to set up equipment when uh, they don't have any, you know, perceived retribution. And uh, it was all, it's also kind of confusing, too, because I don't think that the ISPs and, uh, bigger, and telephone companies aren't really sure that you know they're they're like well you know people are reaching bandwidth and we're potentially losing money but at the same time they're kind of confused they don't know this could potentially be a good thing for them i mean if we were to set up agreements with uh with internet service providers and telephone companies it could be a benefit to them but there's really no clear uh, understanding of what's going to happen and uh privacy too i think uh, one of the big things about community wireless networks especially with the C with the model that we're using with seattle wireless is that uh, it can promote privacy with uh, localized communications if i'm communicating with my neighbors or people down the street from me and i'm going you know over three wireless hops well i'm not going you know i'm not i'm not going my packets aren't going to california and then coming back into seattle because me and my friend are on two different isps so if someone wants to uh, you know inspect that traffic or sniff that traffic they have to come, they have to be in that physical area, and it's not as easily to do remotely. And because it's decentralized, because each person owns their individual node, they can't go to an ISP and they can't say, look, you know, we want to put a tap on all the traffic coming from this person. There's really, there's no core aggregation points for them to come and inspect traffic. Um, and also, you know, to get to get involved with this, you don't have to give, you don't have to give, give us any private information. You don't have to worry about us selling, you know, your your uh, your surfing habits and that type of stuff because it, it can be, be uh, fairly anonymous. Um, and so, the community and independently owned infrastructure, there's um, it's a different it's a different way of thinking, and uh, it's really confusing for a lot of people. They don't they just don't understand. I mean, one of the one of the things that I really like about it 
is that you know when you look at right now the local loop infrastructure, you're basically paying. You know, we're not renting phones anymore from the telephone companies, but it's still pretty close. In a scenario like this, if you wanted to go to the local loop, you just buy your gear, you install it, and you're on the network. Now you can make a voice over IP phone call to your neighbor or to someone across town, and you're not paying 30 bucks a month to the telephone company. Um, so, and that's actually the thing that's interesting. I think about the local loop monopoly is that the, the internet service providers don't realize um, us sharing bandwidth or giving away bandwidth is not really a big threat to them. What's a big What's a big threat to them is the local loop monopoly because that's something that you know once that happens, then they're going to lose they're going to lose a ton of money. And uh, so faster deployment of new technology, uh, basically in an environment like this, in a kind of organic, ad hoc environment, it's a lot easier for us to deploy new technology, stuff like IPv6. You know, we can do a lot of research and development work, and we can move a lot faster and be more flexible than, uh, than a lot of major providers. And uh, let's see, what do we got next here? Peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Okay, so this is another big thing, too. And this goes back to the whole uh, exchanging data with, your, with people in your local area. Um, right now, peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, like file sharing, peer-to-peer -peer communications, uh, it's kind of a weird model because you're, you know, you're, you have no idea where the person is, you have no idea how close they are to you. In a situation like this where you have, a, you could have location-based apps because you know the location of all the physical devices, and a peer-to-peer -peer file, file sharing application or any sort of peer-to-peer -peer app could go out and it could find the most efficient route to your, uh, to, to your node. And, uh, you know, in fact, why, why would you want to go get, you know, something from the internet when uh, you can go get it from your next door neighbor at 11 megabits? And, uh, let's see. And so, more on the peer-to-peer -peer thing, I guess. Um, the, thing, the thing that I think is kind of interesting about this, not even from the wireless perspective, but I think that uh, if the telephone companies would kind of look at the way they're structuring their business right now with, uh, with a lot of this stuff like, peer, like file sharing and whatnot, if they were to offer higher transit to, to all their customers, so say for instance me and my neighbor are both a customer of a particular ISP, you know, I'm rate limited as soon as I leave the door. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't get faster transit to my next door neighbors. And so something like the, something like a, a community wireless network promotes that, and uh, I think it's sending a message to the internet service providers because if they were to provide, you know, faster access to people in the same area as you, not only would it be better for the people that want to exchange data because they'd be getting faster rates, but they also be saving their money because now instead of downloading, you know, your your movie or your MP3s from someone across the country, you're, you're getting it from someone that's on their local network. It's not going out. Your, it's not going out their upstream connection. Um, so basically, the survival. What is it going to take for uh, the wireless community, the, the free network movement, to survive? Um, obviously, strong local community relationships. That's really the with Seattle Wireless. That's one of the core things. Is our monthly meetings, our mailing lists. We have strong communication between everyone involved in the project. That's definitely really important for uh, to promote our survival. Um, pressure on vendors to release drivers and information for open source OSs as uh, as this network and tech as a wireless network and technology is progressing, uh, it's kind of it's kind of funny because now the cards are getting dumber and dumber, and they're going to put more and more of the stuff that's on these cards into software drivers, which means that the FCC is going to, you know, your, your radio is going to be more software than anything, which means that the FCC is going to have to get involved with, uh, so, you know, with, with, uh, software, with the hardware drivers and stuff, and, uh, and they're not going to, they're, they're probably not going to want to release a lot of that information because then if they have, you know, all, if they have all the hooks into this card, then you can pretty much do whatever you want if you know how to operate the card. So I think there's going to be, we've already seen it with 802.11a, where uh, currently the 802.11a chipset that's been shipping, I don't know how long it's been, but it's probably been at least six months. Uh, there is no, or there are no open source drivers for it. There's supposedly binary, binary drivers that a, a Theros, a vendor, has been giving to customers, but there's no open source drivers, and that's because they have so much of the information the driver, they're, they're afraid of giving away trade secrets. So uh, they need to understand that, uh, that this, you know, we need to we need to put a lot of pressure on these guys to to give us the information that we need. Uh, being good RF citizens is also a really big deal. I mean, this is a public band; we're sharing it with everybody. So, uh, you know, you want to you want to work with your local uh, wireless internet service providers. You want to make sure that you're not starting you know any wars with them and doing anything like that. You want to you want to be good citizens. You want to make sure that you're not hooking up a one watt amp to an omnidirectional antenna. You want to try and use point to point links wherever possible so that you're not increasing the amount of noise that, uh, that's, in the, that's in your area. FCC compliance is a big one. This is uh, 
what I was talking about earlier, you know, with Pringles can antennas, with high gain antennas, basically, you know, if this stuff ever takes off, and if we ever, if we ever really progress, um, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to crack down on sta on uh, wireless stations and whether or not they're complying with FCC regulations. Currently, wireless ISPs, not necessarily hotspot providers like the guys in Starbucks, but out in the Midwest in a lot of areas, they're wireless internet service providers that are doing uh, point you know, that are doing fixed point wireless. They're already starting to get inspected by the FCC. The FCC shows up at their door and uh, they want to know, they want to see all the receipts for all the gear, they want to see all your serial numbers, they want to make sure that all the gear is certified to work together. If I go and I buy like a, you know, a wireless card like this, and then I go to another vendor and say this is a Cisco card, and I go to Lucent, and I buy a Lucent antenna and plug it into this card, I just violated FCC regulations because it's not certified, the antenna that I'm using is not certified to this device. So if we want this stuff to actually survive and continue, you know, to progress, we have to be totally, we have to be completely uh, vigilant about making sure that all of our nodes and all of our stations are compliant with, all, with the FCC regulations. Uh, spreading the gospel, you know, obviously, um, I guess, you know, coming to conferences, evangelizing wireless networks, explaining to people, you know, why localized, uh, why localized communications are better. Uh, you know, when I go and talk about this stuff to people that aren't very technical, they have a hard time understanding, you know, the concept of, you know, not worrying about internet access. These are, you know, these people don't even know. When they're their company, they don't know that, there are, that there's an intranet and an internet. They think that everything goes to the internet. So people really need to understand the value of a local network, a local high-speed network. And uh, global collaboration is a big one. There's uh, currently 182 wireless community groups that I know of, ranging from China to North America, Europe, South America. And uh, we need to all we need to all work together and we need to communicate. We try to do that right now with the freenetworks.org. It's kind of like an aggregation point for all the wireless communities. And uh, you know that's really important because we all face a lot of the same technical problems. We all face a lot of the same political problems. And actually, in some cases, we face different political problems. Uh, currently, in France, if you wanted to build a community wireless network, you'd be breaking the law because uh, you're not allowed to use stuff like 802.11b outside of your house. It's against the law. Uh, in, in England, up until about a couple of months ago, uh, it was illegal for any two entities, like say I owned a business and you owned a business and we wanted to set up a wireless link to each other, That's, that wasn't allowed. So, uh, you know, that, all that stuff is really important that we all kind of get on the same page and share information with each other. And uh, finally, you know, how would someone start a community wireless group? I've talked to a lot of people here at DEF CON and, uh, you know, they're really, a lot of people are really frustrated because they live in areas where uh, technology isn't very prominent and they want to do the same thing. They want to start building wireless networks. And uh, obviously, you know, this is pretty, this is a no-brainer. you got to check to see if the group exists in your area. But, uh, you know, go out and start a mailing list, start a web page. Um, one of the, I think one of the things that's helped the Seattle Wireless Project a lot and also the Personal Telco Project in Portland is that uh, our, our web page is a uh, wiki, which basically a wiki is a, a website where anybody can edit any page. And so anyone can go to the site, anyone can add information, anyone can update information, anyone can remove information, and it does this and it keeps back up. So if someone does go and vandalize the site, you can go back and you can restore it. But that that has been really key in our success. I mean, the amount of information that is on the Seattle wireless sites and the personal telco sites is incredible. And if we had to have like a team of webmasters or somebody maintaining all this information, it would never happen. So uh, collaborative technologies like that are really important. And uh, here's a bunch of links, uh, freenetworks.org, Seattle Wireless, all that stuff. If you guys can get the presentation off of the CD, that's all on there. And uh, I guess I was going to wrap it up here with uh, just a couple of dumb pictures that I've collected in the, the past two years that I've been doing this. And uh, kind of give you a little short story on each one. So uh, this was actually one of the first Seattle wireless nodes to go up. It's an omnidirectional antenna that's on this uh, it's on this wooden mast. It was fastened to the house with speaker wire, and uh, so it's obviously not up anymore. So just mental note, speaker wire doesn't hold antennas up. Uh, this is a guy at one of the Seattle wireless meetings. This is actually a node he built that uh, runs DOS. Uh, I think it was just DOS 6.2 with uh, some user land program that does, uh, that does IP routing. So it's actually technically remotely unrootable because you can't actually interactively log into the box. But then again, you can't do any remote administration on it either. And uh, this is actually, this is the reason that I use BSD. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually, this is uh, 
what, this is from a, a digital divide conference that was put on by Microsoft in uh, Seattle, and uh, a bunch of guys from Seattle Wireless went down there because uh, the local Linux users group was kind of demonstrating, because it was one of these things where, you know, Microsoft is trying to, to help out third world countries with uh, expensive software licenses, and so they went to demonstrate and give out free CDs, and so we went down there to, uh, to kind of try and roust up some Linux guys to come and check out the Seattle Wireless project. I don't know, I just thought this is a funny picture, so put it up there. These are the enemy. They're uh, Pringles cans, and uh, we had a big meeting where we were showing everyone how to how to make Pringles cans, just to try to get them involved with the project. And like I said, we don't condone using them. It's a bad idea. They're, they're not bad. They're bad antennas, and they're illegal, so don't use them. And I always think whenever I see this picture, I always think if you ever seen the movie with Steve Martin, the jerk, where he's getting shot at, and he like turns around and looks at the oil cans, and he's like, he hates these cans. That's, that's what I think of it. This is uh, one of the core routers on the Seattle Wireless project. Uh, it belongs to Eric, who's around here somewhere. I don't know if he's here. But it's basically three RG1000 boards that were ripped out and put in a waterproof case. And uh, they all met boot Linux. And uh, you know, and they just, we're currently, we currently use static routes, so nothing fancy going on in there. The boards are like a 486. But uh, we, they got an NFS and a, TP, and a TFTP server in the house. And then it runs power over Ethernet up to the roof and boots Linux on these things. And so there's actually three antennas up on the roof. And uh, this is a funny picture. This is uh, me and my friend Matt, and we were uh, talking to these two guys from NTT, which is a big telephone company over in Asia. And uh, the, the funny thing about this story is that, you know, the telephone companies and big ISPs in the United States, you know, they don't really like us, and uh, they don't really have good things to say about us, but the telephone company in Japan calls us up and uh, basically invites us out to lunch, uh, brings Vizio diagrams of this, you know, 300-node hotspot network that they're rolling out in Japan, and basically asks us questions for an hour about what we think of their, of their network structure, of their business model, all this stuff. So, I mean, it's just kind of an interesting contrast because they love us. But uh, this is my friend Casey sit, uh, standing next to an omnidirectional antenna hooked up to a one watt amp. Uh, I don't condone that either, but he's a he's a he's an amateur radio operator, so he can uh, do stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, we think that's kind of the cause of his acne problem. We don't really know why. I think it's a uh, one watt at two point four. Uh, this is Ben, one of our guys at the Seattle Wireless meeting, uh, brandishing his antenna. And uh, <laughs> no, you know, not meant to have any sexual innuendos there. This is a, a Yagi antenna that he was designing. And uh, this is from the uh, last Wireless Summit. Uh, every year we have a Wireless Summit where we invite uh, community networking groups from all over the country to uh, in one location, and we basically try and hash out all the problems we have. This, we, this last one we had in Seattle, about 200 people showed up, and uh, it was a good time, and that's about it. I don't know, if you guys have any questions, um, I could probably answer a couple of questions here, but uh, we're running kind of behind schedule, so what I'd like to do is probably make, take that couple of questions, is that okay? And then if you guys want to talk to me some more, I'll head out to the bar, and uh, we can talk out there. I'm sorry? There's no such thing as a one-watt antenna. There's... What? No, it was a one-watt amplifier, is what we were using. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know a lot about amplifiers. I believe we were using a Teletronics amplifier. It was like 200 bucks or something like that. But, uh, yeah, don't use amplifiers. They're not, they're not good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, currently, we use a variety of APs. We don't standard. We don't have a standard on any one particular vendor. Um, we use a lot of uh, of loose and APs just because we got into a scenario where uh, we actually did a group purchase and got a bunch of them for sixty dollars a piece. But uh, we're not we're not really vendor specific. Yeah. How do you handle quality of service? We don't. <laughs> That's, that's a good question. Um, well, currently, I mean, it's one of those things, I think, where until we actually have people on the network, using the network consistently, like right now we've got 30 nodes, somewhere between 30, around 30 nodes with seven point-to-point -point links, and there's activity on the network, but there's not really enough to, you know, to, to get stuff like that going. Uh, but, I mean, currently we have no, we have no official plans for doing QoS. Okay, the question
question was, do we have any formal policy about uh, ban about heavy, like bandwidth heavy applications? And uh, no, currently we don't. Um, the way the, w the way we kind of figured that this would end up working out is that if you've got a bunch of people that want to that want to use high bandwidth applications, uh, it's in their best interest to get with the people, the nodes that they're connecting to, and maybe put up additional links so that they can you know get more bandwidth between them. Between them, we currently have really no formal organization whatsoever. Um, it's just it's such a, it's just at such an infant stage that uh, that you know it's just not there. And yet, at some point in time, if it does really take off, then uh, we're going to have to we're going to it's going to be like the internet. You're going to have organizations that do stuff, you know, like Aaron takes care of IP addresses, and this group does that. Uh, that stuff will probably be required if it gets that big, but uh, currently we don't have anything like that. Yeah. I'm sorry? Um, to be honest with you, you mean brand-wise or vendor-wise? The question is what equipment do most clients use to get on the network? Well, currently the structure the structure of the network is that you know outside of the point-to-point -point links there are, there are access points that people get onto. So for the most part, they're just using normal wireless cards. Um, in, the, in in our actual our core network routers, we do we use like uh, we use AI antennas, uh, parabolic antennas, and uh, but as far as like end user, I mean they generally unless they have like a little mini extender antenna or something like that, you know it's just usually a card. Uh, the question is, how do we deal with IP addresses? And that's a that's a good one because uh, we actually use non-routable address space uh, specifically because of the, the organic growth of the network and also for other for other reasons with IPv4 address space. Uh, we feel that it it's better for you know it it allows us to move at our own pace and it allows us to manage our own address space. We're actually setting up a a, a right database to manage to manage the uh, IP space for us. Um, when we're gonna, when we start to do more stuff with IPv6, we're going to try and start using routable addresses, but right now it's not a big deal because we're not really concerned about internet connectivity. I mean, if people want to get on the internet, then yeah, they're going to have to be natted or go through a proxy server or something like that. Um, the question is, what do we do about liability? And uh, that's a, you know that's a good question too. And in the in the sense that we're not really focused on providing internet access, um, we're not really the only liability is within the network. So you know if you have a 30 node network, then the liability is within those 30 nodes. I mean I'm not you know I guess right now the way it would work is that probably someone that I know will call me up and say yeah some dude is ports in your box you know. So there, there currently is really no there currently isn't any liability issues. And uh, obviously if someone wants to provide internet access uh, on one of their nodes, we suggest that they run a portal of some sort, like a catch and release, where, you know, when you get on the node, it gives you a splash page with an acceptable use policy, and, you know, do, do your basic stuff to, you know, whatever, filter port 25. I mean, I know there's, it, it's kind of funny because there's like, you know, you can do all of this stuff, you know, you can block all these ports, but when it comes down to it, as long as there's connectivity going out to the internet, someone can always launch an attack from there, so... But yeah, basically forcing people getting on the network it, uh, to, to see some sort of acceptable use policy and acknowledge it before they before they continue on. Uh, where do I see myself in two years? Well, I know where I don't want to see myself in two years. <laughs> um, that's and that's a good question. Um, I think in two years, I think one of the things that is really going to help our project take off is uh, we've been talking to the city of Seattle about helping them with emergency communications. Uh, because and I think that's going to help us a lot. Emergency communications is interesting because a lot of the emergency communications that they use right now for uh, for doing data transmissions is really low bandwidth. I mean, such low bandwidth that even like encrypting the data is you know like it's a you know it's it's just choking you. So uh, I think that you know stuff like this is really going to help out a lot because not only will they get just you know not only will they be able to exchange way more data but they'll also be able to take better better security precautions too. Yes. You're gonna have to shout really loud. Can I get a repeater in between us? <laughs> can someone can someone relay what he's saying to me? I can't hear him. Could someone uh, relay what he's saying? I can't hear him. What about it? Oh, inner city 
Can I, okay, that's, um, uh, well, we currently don't have it, and I mean, that's, we would have to, if we wanted inner city connection at this point in time, we would have to have, like, some sort of, we'd have to do, like, an IP tunnel over the internet. Um, I mean, I don't, if there was, if there was enough, you know, if there was enough saturation of this movement, I mean, it would be, you know, potentially have, like, a mesh over the entire country. However, uh, the technology that we're currently using won't scale to that point. So, uh, right now, we, do, we don't have any inner city links, and we don't have any uh, VPNs or anything between the different wireless communities. Um, that's a good question. It depends on... The question, the question is how, how large can we grow before, uh, before we kind of reach the scalable limits of uh, 802.11b and uh, it's, we can't really, I would say that, you know, we probably could probably not have more than maybe like 10 or 15 core uh, backbone routers because I mean you only get 11 megabits and it's not actually, you're not even getting 11 megabits, out. using the throughput is about 5 or 6. So uh, that's really, I think, like one of the big, one of the limiting factors. Uh, I don't, I don't really, I couldn't give you any numbers. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up now and uh, get on to the next presentation. And uh, I'm going to head out to the bar if anyone has any more questions for me. Uh, thanks, and I'll talk to you later.